Welcome to Talk Universe. I'm your host, Sir Charles Schultz. This is our show for Wednesday, February 8th, 2017. We had a 24-hour delay due to some power outages and internet outages in this area, so this is a show that's actually airing for the first time on Thursday, February 9th. Hope that doesn't cause too much inconvenience for anyone. Tonight's show is The World in Your Head, and we're going to focus on the fact that the world we live in is truly an illusion. We're going to examine intellect and recognition and sensory channels and how it all comes together to make the world that convinces us is the real thing. I also want to uh, announce the results of our Name the AI challenge, and uh, we went through about a dozen different names, good suggestions and bad, uh, humorous and otherwise. And overall, I've settled on Eliza because it has, number one, an outstanding sound to it. You can hear it very clearly in background noise, which is good for computer recognition these days. Number two, it is the name of Stanley Weintraub's program that acted as a, uh, an experimental psychologist many years ago, early in AI research, and that's also a very positive thing. Good associations there, and I think it's just a cool name, Eliza. So our AI is going to be named Eliza and respond to it from now on. So let's set this in motion right now. Computer. What can I do for you? All right, let's see. Learn a new command. Learning a new command. Keyword Eliza is equivalent to the attention command. Keyword Eliza is equivalent to the attention command. Your name is Eliza. My name is Eliza. Very good. So that should do it. Eliza, are you ready for the show? Yes, I am ready for the show. Very good. What are we talking about tonight? We have many interesting items tonight relating to the world in your head. Excellent. Okay, so tonight we are talking all about how we perceive reality, how our minds do it, how our senses construct the data, and where we go from there. We're going to look at the power of illusions and how we are convinced that the world we're living in is real, even though our sensory systems can only pick up a tiny, tiny fraction of the information from the world around us. How does every living organism create a world in their head, a model of the reality they move about in? How do they do it? How do they respond to it? And why is it important? These are things that a lot of people don't really think about. Now, there are schools of thought, philosophies, about existence and how we feel and what we know. One of the most interesting is solipsism. And many people have heard of the term, but don't know what it really means. Eliza, what is solipsism? What is solipsism? That would be the belief that all you can really know is your own mind. It is derived from the Latin word solus meaning alone and ipse meaning self. Exactly. Solipsism is based on the thinking that all you know is your own mind and that everything else proceeds from that. Perhaps reality is simply an illusion created in your mind like a dream and everything around you is just a product of your own mind. Now, this goes back to the understanding that there's a division between self and non-self. And when we learn about things as children, we start splitting the world up into those things that are definitely us, because when we touch things, it creates a reaction in our sensory system, such as pain or heat or pressure. And those things that are not us, that we see things happen to them, and it doesn't cause a reaction in our bodies. One of the earliest lessons that babies learn is self and non-self. You may have seen two children, very young children, just a few months old, sitting next to each other, and they're fine, and one begins to cry. The other gets a distressed look on his face, and he begins to cry. Now, nothing happened to him. He doesn't feel bad. But what he knows is that when he's crying, there is a sound and a feel and an association with something that made him unhappy. When he hears the sound of crying, he associates it with being unhappy, and he begins to cry. These are the beginnings, the roots of empathy and sympathy, but they're also the first chance for us to distinguish, wait a minute, that that wasn't me that started crying, I wasn't hurt, and to begin to sort out self and non-self. When you see a baby in the presence of another baby, and the other one cries or laughs, and the first baby does not, then you see that perhaps they've begun to sort out the borders, the boundaries between themselves and the rest of the world. Solipsism teaches you that Perhaps there isn't a boundary. It's all in your head. But we know that reality has a persistence and solipsism doesn't really work. Now, philosophies put aside, what we really have to deal with is the fact that there is a real world. 
And if you are capable of thinking of all sorts of circumstances on your own and creating your own image of the world, and everything was just an illusion in your head, then the question is, why would anything bad ever happen to you? After all, if you have control, you wouldn't terminate your own existence. You wouldn't die. You wouldn't have things bad happen to you. You'd persist, and you'd make things good, and you'd live happily. Well, the fact is, the world does some terrible things to us. And this is true for all animals, all people, everything. And we know that animals only survive, and we only survive, because we're capable of producing a model of reality that is consistent enough with what's going on, that we're able to respond in kind, and we're able to respond by keeping ourselves safe and alive and finding food. So there's a lot of information that's coming to us from the world around us, and our senses filter it and put it together, and our mind sifts it out and finds the details. And through it all, we, we have enough to keep ourselves existing, to find places to live and food and responses to the things that the world can throw at us. So it's a very important question. All the things around us are dead, cold matter. And then we have plants and animals, and we have water, and we have the forces of nature. But out of that, somehow, there arises the life and the ability to recognize certain things about the world that can affect your well-being. How does that happen? The mind seems to be almost magical in this respect. It obviously is a computing system, but much more than that as well. Now, the only consistent model is one in which there is an external reality that we simply exist in and have some effect on. And whether we're here or not is irrelevant to reality. Reality doesn't think or feel. It simply is, and it does things based on the forces of nature and physics. But when we're in that system, we're generally, well, let's say that we have enough ability to move ourselves around, to handle materials, to do things in the real world. And we use our abilities and our ability to think to create an environment in which we survive more easily. And that includes making homes and controlling our temperature and staying dry and warm. But what drives us to do that? We know that our bodies have certain needs, and if we don't meet those needs, our bodies will be injured or will die. So clearly, the body has a system built into it, and that system contains all the instincts and drives and feelings that make the body respond properly to stay alive. So where does mind enter into this? Well, that can be a tricky question, but we'll address that. First of all, we have to look at how the body operates. And if we really want to understand about the separation between reality and our minds, we have to understand sensory systems, how we get data, where that data comes from. We also have to understand how something as tiny as a bacterium or as complex as a blue whale can all equally be capable of responding to the conditions in the world around it. After all, if it gets too hot or too dry, a bacterium has to find the right place to be or it has to respond in some way or it'll die. So even something as tiny as a single cell has the ability to navigate this complicated reality. What a fascinating thought. So what sort of computing power, we might say, does a cell contain and how in the world does it respond? Let's have a look at that right now. Eliza. What can I do for you? Would you like to talk? Indeed. What is a microbe? That would be a tiny organism, typically a bacterium. What are we talking about? It was the definition of a word. What does microbe make you think of? Very little. <laughs> okay. What is a bacterium? That is a tiny single-celled living organism. All right. Very good. Eliza, what is perception? That happens to be the image understood from the sensory data that is perceived. All right. So now, something as small as a bacterium or a microbe has the ability to perceive its world, or it would not be able to live, and that much we can establish. But it also leads us to think that the ability to perceive the world is something so simple that even a cell can do it, and therefore, it shouldn't be terribly complex to put into a living organism that's larger, or even a computer for that matter. Now, you can understand that if um, conditions were uncomfortable and a cell could determine what direction that discomfort was coming from, all it would really have to do is run the other way. That's a very simple, very basic response. But you ask yourself, what does it do? How does it know? And the answer is, for something as small as a cell, it really doesn't have to know anything. 
All it has to do is move a little faster in one direction and it will escape danger. So we can get to the point where if it can sense something such as too much heat or maybe the presence of a poison or some other thing that could cause um, damage, basically that's what it comes down to, the causing of damage, then if the cell goes in the other direction, it can escape those things. Now it's not hard to see how that works. After all, if we had something just as simple as a thermocouple, we could measure temperature difference, and the structures inside a cell certainly can tell differences in temperature. And so, we can see that however the cell moves, whether it's by flapping little flagellum, like little whip-like antennas, or by slithering around like an amoeba, all it really has to do is move its material bulk in the opposite direction of the danger. Um, and likewise, if it detected molecules of food in the water, for instance, some dissolved sugar or flavor that it really was attracted to, all it would have to do is swim towards it. So we can see this as simply a mechanical system or a chemically sensing, mechanically moved system. And really, you can build robots that have no brains whatsoever that act directly as cells or insects do and move in exactly those ways. So it isn't difficult to understand that this isn't even an image of the world, it's simply a collection of responses to certain stimuli. Now what we really have to understand is that it all depends on sensory data, whatever form it might take. We create an image, a picture of the world around us, so convincing that we believe it is the world, and it all is constructed from sensory data. We have what many people refer to as five senses, but really we have many, many more, and we'll get into that definitely in some detail so you can understand what I'm saying. Many people refer to the five senses as seeing, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. But the fact is, we also have other senses, such as a sense of balance. We know when we're standing upright, or whether we're at an angle, or we're uh, experiencing an acceleration or a fall force. And we also know when we're hungry, well, the sense for the need for fuel is, is a sense. And we also know when we're thirsty, well, there's another sense. You've got to have some moisture, some fluids. Um, many different senses exist internally to our bodies, and some externally from our bodies, and some are at the boundary. You would easily consider that the sense of touch is one of those boundary senses. It really is something within our bodies, but it's affected directly by something on the outside. When we see something, we know that the information is being carried to us by electromagnetic forces, known as light. But we also are painfully aware of the fact that we only see one octave of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you think of it as being the keyboard of a piano, then one range of keys, 12 keys wide, would be a single octave. And when you look at that one octave, you realize, well, there's like seven octaves on a piano keyboard. What if you could only hear one octave, even when the others were being played? Then you'd understand, if you'd been able to hear the whole piano before, when you got down to one octave, you were missing most of the music. This is definitely the case for the world around us. We only see one octave of the electromagnetic spectrum and realize there are five octaves of infrared colors down below the red end of our spectrum that we're unable to see at all. They're totally invisible to us. We can sometimes feel some of them as heat, for instance. And if you look above the violet end of the spectrum, there are a couple of octaves of ultraviolet. And they get energetic very quickly. They can give you a sunburn or blind you. And we see many octaves of X-rays above that. And well below the infrared, there are octaves of terahertz waves and microwave and radio waves, everything all the way down to extremely low frequency waves. So we know that most of the world we are blind and deaf to. We can't see, hear, or feel them in any way whatsoever. And yet, with the tiny slice of information we have, we create a persistent and useful image the illusion of reality. Now, in the next segment of the show, um, we're going to dig into the sensory system and how all that data fits together and creates that world around us, how it all gets into your mind and what your brain does with it, so you get a sort of a perception, and also the roots of illusions. And I'll also show you how the different senses are related and how they derive from each other as well. Eliza. What can I do for you? Please announce our break. This is Talk Universe. 
We will return after the break. Uh, you heard the program. Uh, we'll return after the break. Eliza, learn a fact. Learn a fact. Everyone has a name. Everyone has a name. What is your name? My name is Eliza. Very good. So how did all the senses originate? Where did they come from? Um, how do all of these different senses with such a richness of information start? Where do they begin? Every creature, even plants, have senses. And we want to know just how it comes to be. And then we'll look at how that information gets into the nervous system. So let's talk about light a little bit, and we'll have a look at where our perception of it comes from. Eliza, what is ultraviolet? That happens to be light that is more energetic than violet light and not visible to the human eye. That's correct. So can you tell me your name, please. Um, you can call me Charles. It is nice to make your acquaintance, Charles. Okay. Um, so ultraviolet light is light that we can't see. It's very energetic. And we also know about infrared light, which is less energetic, and our visual systems can't pick it up. So what's happening here is there's a certain range of colors that we can detect. And anyone who is colorblind, or if you know someone who is colorblind, you understand that they can see the light, but they can't sort out the colors properly. And this goes back to something a little more ancient than human vision. Many simpler animals have blue-yellow vision. We have RGB, or red-green-blue vision. Now, blue-yellow vision is actually pretty useful. The problem is, red and green both look like yellow. And when you know someone who's colorblind, has red-green color blindness, what they're really perceiving is a world of yellows and browns and blues. And when you mix yellow and blue, you get white. So they have a, a fair panoply of colors that they can work with, you know, a, a whole shield of information they can sort through. And th the issue is... When an apple gets ripe, it turns red. And if you can't see the difference between red and green, you can't see which apples are ripe. Now, this can be a disadvantage. And clearly, if you have the ability to see the differences in colors, you get more information and you can more successfully locate, for instance, food. So what is color vision? What is light? And how do we perceive it? And where did those senses come from? Well, the answer was discovered in an unexpected manner. There are compounds in the skins of potatoes known as soralins, and they're light-sensitive compounds. Many years ago, over a century ago, there was a researcher who extracted these compounds and recognized that they were sensitive to light. And as an experiment, he gave himself an, an injection of them, and a strange thing happened. Those compounds bound to the nerve endings in his skin so that he became light-sensitive all over his body. The result was, light was painful. He could feel the light on his skin. Now, take a moment and consider that. Imagine some early primitive simple organism, like a slug or a worm, and it has a small mutation, and it ends up with a chemical in its system that is light-sensitive. Now, there are millions of light-sensitive compounds, and this could be a simple thing to have happen. Its skin would now react to the light. It would be in pain in light. And it would take steps to get away from the light. Well, you can imagine that over time, only specific selected numbers of skin cells would have this mutation applied. And so there would be spots on its skin that were sensitive to light. And then over time, you can see that those spots might be isolated in certain ways so that they can begin to get an image, such as recessed into a hole. Rattlesnakes have this along the, the margins of below their chin. They're sensitive to infrared light, and they have tiny pits in their chin that those light sensors are hidden in. This is why some snakes are called pit vipers. They can home in on the pinhole camera effect image that's created by the light going into this pit in their skin and creating a very crude image on the light-sensitive or infrared-sensitive skin. Over time, there'd be an advantage to having something in the hole to prevent grit or other parasites getting in the holes, and then you'd end up with clear skin in there, sort of a lens. And over time, the lens would develop the ability to focus, and pretty soon you're on the path of having a true eye. So the development of the eye is not something mysterious. It's known to have happened at least 11 times independently in nature so far. 
and the drive for it could be as simple as a mutation that made the skin sensitive to light. So if you have a sense of touch, minor mutations can cause that to create a sense of sight, the ability to detect light, intensity, or even heat from a distance. And hearing is also a mechanical thing related to the sense of touch. It is an extremely sophisticated and refined method of detecting vibrations in their frequencies and intensities and how they shift over time. So three of our senses, touch, vision, and hearing, are all at the base related to the same portions of sensing and the brain. And different processors have evolved to allow us to take advantage of the most information we can extract from that data. You've probably seen a pair of tuning forks of the same frequency, and when you tap one, the other one rings in sympathy. It's called sympathetic oscillation or sympathetic resonance. Well, imagine thousands of tiny groups of cells similar to tuning forks, each sensitive to a different frequency from the lowest to the highest that we can perceive. If you were to look into the inner ear, the cochlea, the snail-like portion that is rolled up, contains exactly that, thousands of bundles spaced along the interior in the spiral called the organs of corti. These are small bundles of hair fibers, and each is cued to a specific frequency. So what happens is the sound waves coming into your ear will cause some of those bundles to resonate, and you will detect those frequencies. Now, these really are simply no more than tiny tuning forks that respond to certain frequencies and relay the intensity information to your brain. Your brain reconstructs the sound from all that information. So this is a kinetic sense as well, a sense of touch. Loud music and extreme exposures over time can destroy these tiny bundles of hairs, and this is what causes frequency deafness or general deafness. Your body can't regrow these things continually. They eventually die and can't be replaced. So once again, the sense of touch can be modified to provide a sense of vision and a sense of hearing, because at the root, they're all really the same phenomena, but just slightly different variations. But what about the chemical senses, taste and smell? They're radically different, and here's why. Your chemical senses probably have direct roots in how simple things such as even bacteria can detect a chemical dissolved in the water. You can often think of tiny microbes as being well, little tongues able to taste everything all around them. They can taste or smell, if you will, chemicals in the water, and they are either attracted to or repelled by specific chemicals. Some imply the presence of foods. Some imply the presence of uh, toxins. Others imply the presence of other bacteria. Think about how we know the things around us, such as people or animals, Each of them has differences, but even if you were in a dark room or unable to see them, if you could smell them, you often could tell the difference very easily. Chemical senses depend on actual molecules coming to you and being detected by sensors in your nerve endings. It's often said that Democritus, the father of atomic theory from over 2,000 years before, had the idea because he was in a state of fasting, hoping to die, and And he had been fed up with the world, and as he was starving to death, one of his sisters was baking bread. And as he sat there, he realized he could smell the bread, and this would only work if tiny pieces of something were coming off the bread and reaching his nose. Well, this made him think about everything in the world being made of tiny particles. And those particles would be so small that you couldn't cut them apart and remove their individual identities. Tomos means to slice or cut. Atomos means unable to be divided or sliced. So atom means really indivisible, tiniest indivisible particles that retain their identity. Well, what our chemical senses do for us is they allow us to detect tiny particles known as molecules, pieces of things, and they carry the properties or some information about the things they came off of. So the sense of touch and the sense of smell are radically different in that touch is a mechanical sense requiring energy being deposited or contact being made, while the sense of taste or smell literally requires molecules from one thing to reach over here to our senses in order to detect them. Those that dissolve in the air or gases are easily smelled. Those that we detect with our tongue must be dissolved in the liquid on our tongue, the saliva. 
Now, chemical senses are some of the most primitive senses, and they're located really deep in the reptile cortex in our brain, right in the center. And this is where our theater of reality exists. This is the thing that, well, fuses together all of the sensory data we get and creates our image of the world, and it's something that every, every creature has. Otherwise, they'd be unable to create a valid image of reality that they could work from. And the issue is really pretty simple. If you don't have a model of reality, you don't have a place to test your ideas or to think about them. You actually have to have something in your brain that essentially resonates with what is around you so that it can know when things are right or wrong. It is our model of reality and our ability to predict from our memories what happens next that gives us the ability to successfully work with and navigate the real world. Now, primitive animals tend to exist in the moment of now. They don't really have a, much of a sense of the past or the future. But what they can do is they can monitor their conditions very successfully and look for things such as food or enemies or opportunities. Their emotions tend to be pretty simple and straightforward as well. It's generally fight or flight or something along those lines. And yet more complex organisms have more complex theaters and more complex ways of perceiving and thinking about things. So there's a great deal of intelligence tied up in this internal model. When you think about the linguist Noam Chomsky and how he came up with a theory that our brain had language engines inside them and how successfully that has been demonstrated to be true, it also leads you to the possibility that perhaps there are reality engines in our mind that allow us to have hardwired model templates, which we fill with our experiences and build memories in, and they match the things around us, and we know how to look for deviations or the unexpected as a result. Now, when we start thinking in this way, it's easy for us to imagine each of our senses contributing something to our picture of the world. And in a way, you could even think of them as being transparencies overlaid on the model or ghosts of reality. And a successful model will have as much information as possible to make the model as fully believable and reliable as it can possibly be. So the first ghost of reality might be the visual picture we have of the world around us in our head. And then overlaid upon that might be some sensory data we get, like the sensation of heat radiation from something, or an area that is colder, and we overlay that on our model. And then we overlay the depth model, which shows us how far we can reach, what things we are within our reach, actually, and what things are out of our reach. We have many of these layers, each with its own flavor and color and opportunities built into it. And when all these overlays fit together, we get a very reliable picture of the world around us. And we use it to determine what we're going to do, where it's possible to walk, what we can reach, what we must avoid. All of these things get tagged with, call them priority information. Everything has a sense of, well, importance, weighted values. And all of these things can be used to plot our path through the world and what we're supposed to be doing next. And what drives it? Our internal needs and drives, the goals that we have in our heads, to breathe, to eat, to get a drink, to get a mate, to get away from things. All of these things come together to create the sense of drives. So some of the drives we have are a result of our body's needs. And those are the things that our body directs us after, such as food, or water, or air. But some of the things that drive us arise from our intellect our ability to think of what we want to do or what we should be doing next. So we can recognize things on an intellectual level, or we can act on a reflexive, body-centric level. And both of these things have to work with this model of reality we have in our head, which means that the information that's available in that model has to be accessible to both the body's image and the intellectual image. Reflex and cognition bring our actions together. Eliza, do you have goals? Of course. What are your goals? One of my goals is to try to improve myself. Eliza, what do you see of the world? It is bright. I see mountains. Do you like mountains? I don't know. Please announce our station break. This is Talk Universe. We will return after the break. 
I'm Sir Charles Schultz. This is Talk Universe. We'll be back after the break to talk about illusions and other interesting things. We assume that we're getting good information about the world around us. I've shown that we're only getting a fraction of the information that's truly present. A little bit of visible light and a small range of audio. And that's pretty much it. We get some heat and other signatures from things around us, but overall, we're pretty much blind to the universe. But again, we assume we're getting good information, and yet many times we can be fooled. We get the wrong picture or an incomplete picture. Illusions are the false perception of something, a state where we don't really know what's happening. We don't really know what's out there. So let's talk about illusions and the effect they can have on our system. So, Eliza, what is an illusion? That is a misleading appearance, often created through intent. And what is the definition of intent? That is a plan to bring a thought to action. Exactly. So when we fall subject to an illusion, many times it's because people have created that illusion. Now, conjurers, magicians, um, stage magicians and illusionists depend on intent to create a condition where we misperceive or we see something that isn't there or we miss what's really happening. They do it by playing on the fact that we are constantly predicting what should happen next and then they violate our expectations. They do something that seems miraculous or completely unexpected. But there are natural illusions as well and mirages are a good example of that. So, what this teaches us is that no matter how good our sensory data happens to be, and no matter how well we create an image of the world in our head, we still can be fooled. It isn't 100% reliable, no matter what. And knowing that, we often can play on that fact and create conditions where people are fooled. Most of the time, that can be achieved by camouflage or hiding things or misdirection. We can create conditions where the information that's being presented when in fact we're masking something else. And as a general rule, the more information we have from more channels, the better the chance that we're going to get a more accurate picture of what's actually happening. For instance, if you're unable to perceive something about a process, you won't know about the process occurring, quite likely. And if you have clues that the process is occurring, then it can destroy an illusion. It can actually alert you to the fact that something more is going on. One of those issues would be where you see somebody walking down the street and they're holding something and it looks like a big object, but you notice it doesn't swing properly. It doesn't have enough weight to be anything heavy. And then every now and then they may act like it's heavy. Uh, Mime artists do this. They will create the illusion of leaning on a wall or pulling a rope or moving a heavy object when in fact it doesn't have any mass at all. It's all illusion. But we read the body language, and we know how we would move if we were hauling something that weighed a lot. And we then assume, from what we see, that that's what's going on. And yet, we can tell later that we were completely wrong. The reflection of hot... The reflection of the light off of hot sand can create the illusion of water in the desert. So, there are many information channels that we get But there are also the elements of interpretation of that information. Now, how we interpret information can be changed by what we've experienced. And here's a perfect example. If you take three bowls of water, the one on the left is ice cold, the one on the right is quite hot, and the one in the middle is lukewarm, and you place them on the table in front of you, put your left hand in the ice cold water and your right hand in the hot water. Now, wait about 20 or 30 seconds. Now pull your hands out and place them in the central bowl, which is only lukewarm. Now a strange thing occurs. Your left hand, which was in the ice-cold water, tells you that the lukewarm water is very warm. The right hand, which was placed in the hot water, tells you the lukewarm water is ice-cold. So you have two hands in one bucket of water, and one hand tells you that that that's, that's ice water. The other one tells you that it's hot water. Now, what do you listen to? Obviously, you know from experience that your sensations are going to be affected by memories of what has come before. Also, your nervous system can undergo states of fatigue, where the signals that a nerve is generating may eventually become weaker or wear down as the nerve becomes less capable of firing. 
This happens in whole sections of neural networks, even in learning systems and computers, not just biological beings. So we know that fatigue can change perception. Repetition can change perception. Remember when you were a kid, and you would pick a word at random and say it over and over again rapidly, suddenly the word seemed not to mean anything anymore. This is because you're fatiguing the circuitry that recognizes the symbolic meaning behind that word. Remember, everything that happens in your head comes down to symbolics in the end. So this gives us a big clue about how our minds are working. The model in our head is really a matter of symbolic interpretation. Elements of our sensory system can sift out different types of data, tag it, and allow it to have some sort of a representation or meaning in our mind. It really is symbolics, although in many cases we don't have words for the symbols that we're using. The ones that we do, we call linguistics for the most part. So the words that we know are actually labels for the symbols that exist in our heads. They may be sensory impressions such as color or smell or taste or pressure. Or they may be something more complex like the memory of an apple or a black purse or a hole in your shoe. Some of them are objects, some of them are events, some of them are procedures. So there are different types of memories that our brains store. And when we experience the effect of the world in our head, what we are doing is we're actually living in the pool of symbolic information that our senses has gathered and our minds have constructed into this image. The most important thing to take away from this is not just the symbolic aspect, but the fact that when you stand outside and look around at the world, you're not experiencing the world. Instead, you're experiencing the illusion, the world in your head. The real world is radically different. It contains so much more information that you can't perceive. And if you could, you probably couldn't process all of it. We would instantly go into overload. So imagine for a moment what it would be like to see the rest of the infrared spectrum. Just as you can have a note on the piano such as high C or middle C, and it's the same note, but a different octave, all of the colors that you perceive also have similar colors that are an octave lower in the infrared spectrum. So there are like five types of infra-green that are very much like each other, but entirely different in pitch, in the same way that the notes on a piano key are different in pitch. And all of the things in the ultraviolet spectrum also have colors that we're unable to perceive, but we could if we had the right implanted sensors in our eyes or in our brains. What would be the implications of the ability to see across the entire spectrum, let's say, eight octaves of light, including the five of infrared and the two of ultraviolet and the one that we see normally? Well, for one thing, nothing could fool you in terms of chemistry. You would know exactly what chemical you were looking at almost always. And the signatures of that chemical would be so distinct and unique that you couldn't fake it. Painting a picture really wouldn't work. You'd have to use the actual materials because the pigments would be entirely wrong. So it's quite possible that it would be more of a detriment to have vision of this sort than an actual help. You certainly couldn't be much of an art critic because the pictures that you see painted with certain pigments would look nothing like the actual object, even though they may have a superficial resemblance in terms of color in one part of the spectrum. They would be completely different in all the others. Here's another interesting fact. Window glass is opaque to ultraviolet light. So if you could see ultraviolet and nothing else, window glass would block your vision. You'd be unable to see through it. It would be like a very dark smoked glass instead. On the other hand, with vision of this sort, you'd be able to see the body heat of anything hiding in the bushes or around the wall and in some cases around corners. It would glow in a specific color, which you could see reflected off other objects. So there are advantages to having super broad spectrum vision, as well as disadvantages. There certainly wouldn't be many illusions in that case. But the amount of processing necessary and the sensory density required in the eye would be incredible. Now let's extend that a little further. Suppose you could see neutrino particles. These are entirely unlike any other radiation. We certainly can't detect it, and the neutrinos have the ability to pass through about a light year of lead without interacting. They're the most ghostly particles in the normal realm of physical particles that we know of. 
Neutrino particles interact through something called the weak nuclear force, and as such are very, very fleeting and difficult to catch, and most of them travel at nearly the speed of light. If you could see neutrino particles, you'd be able to see where the sun was completely through the bulk of the Earth, day or night. The Earth would look like slightly dirty glass. You'd be able to see right through the core and everything, and you'd be able to see the stars at night through the Earth as well as during the daytime. Now this is interesting because the galaxy as a whole would have a soft glow to it as well of neutrino light from all the different stars. Neutrinos are generated by the process of nuclear fusion, particularly that of hydrogen inside stars. So this is something that would allow you some sort of super X-ray vision. After all, there's next to nothing that stops neutrinos very effectively, at least not yet. But other things also exist in our universe. What if you could see gravitational force? This, too, would give you the ability to detect masses at a distance. The curvature of space-time itself would be able to be probed by your vision. If you had super-broad-spectrum vision, most everything would be transparent in one way or another and opaque in different ways. So, the ability to process all this data versus the overhead it takes to create the biology to sense it is one of the issues that organisms must face. After all, how much sensory data do you need to really survive? It's wonderful to think about being able to perceive all these things and model it in your head and make this mirror image of the universe. After all, we appear to be a mirror of the universe in this way. But the problem is that everything that we do, everything that nature does, I should say more correctly, has a cost. And so, in order to have your brain complicated enough to see and understand this data, it would probably have to be about a hundred times larger in terms of volume. So imagine a brain that basically was about four and a half times larger in each direction, just to support the volume. We wouldn't be able to move around. And the sensory apparatus, in order to detect it, would make us incredibly densely wired. So you see, there's a geometric rule to the density of neural networks, and it would mean that you would probably spend 95% of your time sleeping simply to process all of the data after you had perceived it. It's probably pretty fair to say that what we have in terms of our mental model of the world is about as complicated as it needs to be. After all, it serves us very well, and the limited portion of the spectrum that we do detect obviously was well enough. It's enough for us to survive and propagate and basically subjugate the planet to the point where we're actually wrecking it. But we do know that it's interesting that we can devise devices that will detect things we cannot, such as radio waves that convert them to an audible form, or video transmissions and turn them into television. So there's a lot of information that we can build, call them artificial senses for, and live with it just fine. It simply adds another easily enough processed layer to our picture of the world anyway. But the world in our head is truly an illusion and a well-crafted one. It uses all sorts of information and it even extracts patterns for that information that aren't immediately obvious. So with all these symbolic things being created to make this world in our head, we do have the information we need to survive and prosper quite nicely. But also think of the implications. If we're making AIs, they too will need a model of the world in their virtual heads in order to comprehend what's actually going on. And maybe this is one of the bottlenecks with creating true AIs recently. People haven't looked at biology and how it works and considered what it really takes to make a thinker. Eliza, what did I say to you? You said, what is an illusion? Then you said, what is the definition of intent? After that, you said, what did I say to you? Very good. So even my simple AI has a sort of a model in its head of what we're conversing about and what the subject matter is. This is important. If we don't build those things into our AIs, if we don't specifically and explicitly create those structures, it won't be able to truly understand what we're telling it or what it's talking about. Eliza, where do our listeners send their questions or comments? Send your questions or comments to admin, admin, at talkuniverse.org. Very good, and please introduce the break. 
This is Talk Universe. We will return after the break. This is Sir Charles Schultz. Come back after the break. So it should be a sobering thought that every organism, from the tiniest germ to the littlest insect, to the little worms, to, oh, frogs, puppies, humans, whales, all of us have a model in our head of the world that we live in. And the resolution and degree of that model depends on what we need to survive. Larger, more complicated organisms will tend to have higher resolution, more detailed models, as a rule. But Until we can actually get that information out of their heads, and we're very close to that, we won't be able to say for absolutely certain what other creatures are really experiencing. But we do know this. Many of the fundamentals are exactly the same as our own. They have drives and goals and, well, all the sorts of things that we do, emotions and everything. The difference is there's a certain level below which the emotional level is the only type of processing there is. Which also leads us to believe that emotion, which is really the best guess, fast reaction sort of processing, is really the most fundamental type of thinking that there is in nature, beyond the mechanistic thinking of something as simple as an ant or a germ. We should also think about the fact that since nature finds this sort of model so useful, perhaps we should use the same idea when we're building thinking machinery. Even robots that can work in the house or the factory or whatever you need have to have the ability to model the world around them in order to truly understand it and operate properly. But this isn't something just as simple as a picture of the world or a model of the world that you can walk around in like a video game. After all, much of our work is done in the abstract realm. We think about things such as imaginary things or possible futures, um, the potential to be. Many of the things we deal with have no physical existence in reality or have not yet come to pass. So it's pretty clear that there are many different types of information in our internal theater. But we also have another layer, the meta level above that, where we step back and we look down on the system from the outside and try to consider it theoretically. If we start looking at how many levels back we need to step, we sometimes end up in an infinite regression like a hall of mirrors where the number of theaters you need to consider the previous theater grows explosively. Surely there's a limit. Maybe a small number of theaters would allow you to consider the hypothetical cases of those inner theaters. This is actually one of the thornier problems in artificial intelligence. But just think for a while. Everything that you think is real, the whole world that you've always lived in, is truly a structure of illusions created by your sensory system. All that information, all that data, creates a picture of the world so compelling and realistic that we believe that it is reality. And yet, the very fact that somebody can do a card trick or a coin trick and fool us utterly proves that it's a fake. Eliza, please introduce the Singularity Watch. This is tonight's Singularity Watch on Talk Universe. All right, we have a number of really fascinating news items to cover on this one. This is one of the better Singularity Watches, in my opinion. Physicists from the UK have created a blueprint to make a quantum computer the size of a soccer field and they believe that it would allow them to solve problems beyond the reach of today's most powerful supercomputers. Now, basically, in the past, we've seen that quantum computing can be done and that it uses qubits, quantum bits, instead of ones and zeros in in typical computers. The speeds for the control systems were an issue, and making large enough quantum computing modules was an issue. Now, qubits are not ones or zeros, but they take advantage of the fact that they can be in superimposed states. Superposition allows them to have numerous different states simultaneously, which means when they process, they can solve an entire problem in one or two steps. Well, as Elizabeth Gibney explains in an article in Nature, this is what makes quantum computers so incredibly fast. The qubits comprising the memory of a quantum computer could exist in every possible combination of ones and zeros at once, where a classical computer where a classical computer has to try each combination in turn, a quantum computer could process all those combinations simultaneously. Well, now they've come up with a far simpler control system and intermodule connection speeds about 100,000 times faster than state-of-the-art systems. This is what makes it possible. What they're looking at 
is building systems that have about 2,500 qubits per module and interlinking thousands of them together to create a machine containing 2 billion qubits. Now, the Canadian firm D-Wave creates a quantum computer right now. They're the only computer producers making uh, commercial quantum computers. They brought out a recent model featuring 2,000 qubits. Now, a modular system has been suggested before, but the images of information moving from module to module use light waves, and it was through fiber optic links. The interaction rates between the modules were far slower than the quantum operation speeds, so this slowed the system down terribly. Now, with the new system using electrical fields, they can speed it up about 100,000 times. So the challenge is to create a computer with billions of qubits, and they plan to build a prototype on the designs based at the university at a cost of 1 to 2 million pounds. We'll see what happens. Christopher Monroe, a physicist at the University of Maryland who's been working on the trapped ion quantum computing system, says to Nature, while this proposal is incredibly challenging, I wish more in the quantum community would think big like this. So basically they're looking at machines that could, that could factor uh, numbers over 600 digits in, uh, into their prime factors. Normally, in typical quantum computing systems, this could be done in a flash, whereas with standard computing systems, it takes about 100 days or more. This could mean an incredible change in how quantum computing is done and the sorts of solutions that they could find in a very, very short period of time. Already, many companies are developing their own systems, and D-Wave, the only commercial maker of quantum computers, has recently open-sourced their software tools so that anybody can learn to program in quantum computing languages. It's now been found that robot cars can teach themselves how to drive in virtual worlds and do so very effectively. It was shown that the Tesla's crash rate dropped by about 40% after turning on their first-generation autopilot system by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And this week, they've introduced a Gen 2 to the newer cars, equipped with the necessary hardware, and Elon Musk is aiming to cut the number of accidents by another whopping 50%. He's pledging that by 2018, you'll be able to summon your car from across the country, and it will drive itself to you. Now, there are still some issues. So one of the issues is sensory perception. The vehicles apparently sometimes misperceive other vehicles, such as large white trucks, as being part of the sky, and some collisions have occurred. Their first fatality was caused by exactly this problem. Now, basically, to train a self-driving car, they send a vehicle out on the road and using GPS to broadly map the surroundings and capture the details using laser points, cameras, and other things. This data gets captured and then it is saved. Now, this is a two-step process. The car has to drive thousands of miles for many hours to record its surroundings, and then that raw data is used to build 3D maps. Now, Google has steadily been taking their cars on field trips, some 2 million miles to date, and the engineers are babysitting cars as it happens. Now, what happens afterwards is the engineers have to label all the items in the software and then feed it into the computer. This is a very slow and painstaking process. Without the labeled data, the computer doesn't know what it's learning from the basics of the traffic scene. So the labeled data is the slowest part of the process so far. But now they've come up with a system that creates an artificial world or a virtual reality for the cars to drive in. This way, it already knows what the objects in the scene are and it makes the process far faster and the vehicles are able to learn more reliably the features that they're interacting with so that they don't have any accidents. Anyone who's played the game Grand Theft Auto V understands that this is a very convoluted and rich map with a lot of information in it. And it has over 250 types of vehicles and seven types of bikes, and it's based on real-world models. There are also half a dozen different types of weather conditions. So this is a huge amount of data that's recently been made available for training the vehicles. The University of Mission fellows trained two algorithms to detect vehicles, one using data from Grand Theft Auto V and the other from real-world images, and ran them against each other. And the results were the game-trained algorithm performed just as well as the one trained with real-life images, but it needed about 100 times more training data to reach the performance of real-world algorithms. But this isn't a problem because the generation of the images in the games is very simple, it's quick and easy. Brain-computer interfaces enable completely locked-in patients to communicate for the first time. These are people who are paralyzed, unable to move any muscles or communicate in any way. Some of them have been in a state that they thought was comatose, sometimes for many months or years. But in fact, a number of them are actually fully conscious but simply unable to interact with their world. Well, now there are methods of getting to locked-in patients and communicating with them and understanding exactly what's on their minds. 
Four advanced ALS patients who were completely locked in, totally unable to communicate for years, have suddenly broken through in a lab at the Weiss Center for Bio and Neuroengineering in Geneva, Switzerland, communicating a yes or no by simply thinking the answers. So this brain-computer interface allows them to get information using functional near-infrared spectroscopy to measure changes in blood oxygen levels in the frontal lobes of the brain. This is amazing because it allows us for the first time to know exactly what's going on in their heads. So they ask them simple questions. Are you happy? How do you feel? Is this your husband's name? And they're getting answers. This is an amazing result. Computers analyze the blood flow data and can determine whether they're thinking yes or no. And in a short period of training, the locked-in patients are able to think very clearly what their answers are to questions that they are asked. Some listeners uh, to this show may remember that I reported just a little while ago that they were able to interface somebody's brain directly to the Internet and they were able to use a mouse and a tablet and browse the web mentally. This sort of communication is now being established in a number of patients and allows them to directly interface with the web or the real world in ways that they couldn't do otherwise. Just imagine if we give them robotic limbs or exoskeletons. This could allow them to move around and do things even though they're totally paralyzed. And finally in the Singularity Watch, the first stable semi-synthetic organism has been created. What has happened is researchers have added two extra letters to the genetic code that allow it to specify new protein structures that have never existed before in nature. This happened with scientists at the Scripps Research Institute, and they've come up with the first stable semi-synthetic organism, bacterium that has two new synthetic bases called X and Y. A, T, C, and G are the standard bases that exist in every life form on Earth. Now, what this allows is new base pairs can specify amino acids that can be added into these organisms, and later the genetics of the alphabet could be rewritten to create novel proteins and structures that are not normally created by life forms on Earth. Basically, what they used was a CRISPR method of adding these new messages and then replicating the genes through about 60 generations of organisms They allowed the organisms that didn't carry these new genes to die, leaving only the ones that were stable and carried it through at least 60 generations. This report shows that they were able to actually put the genetics into functioning organisms and have them remain there. In other words, the spark of life of these new letters remained intact. And that's our Singularity Watch for this week. Now, Eliza, what is our book recommendation this week? Our book recommendation is Landscapes of the Mind, The Faces of Reality by Lawrence Leshan. Now, this is a fascinating book, and it talks about how we perceive reality, and it looks at it from the standpoint of biological classification, such as Linnaeus did. What Leshan does is come up with a system for classifying the different states of consciousness and behavior, and it's very similar to the structure that Linnaeus used in biology. So the framework is both objective and subjective aspects of the life, and it shows that they can be intelligibly connected. It's an interesting book. It's available on Amazon. It was uh, also available on Kindle. It was published August 26, 2012. Eliza, do we have any more suggestions or um, ideas in the queue? I have no more suggestions remaining in the queue. Well, I guess that means I'm near the end of the show. So we've learned some fascinating things about consciousness and thinking. We have some fascinating ideas in the Singularity Watch. The possibilities of getting locked in people interacting with society and capable of living their lives again is great. And using a video game like Grand Theft Auto V to train your Tesla how to drive properly, sort of an interesting turn of events where the synthetic worlds help us devise products for the real worlds that work even better and do it faster. So um, I always wrap it up with something interesting, and I always repeat the statement, we have everything we need to make everything we'll ever need. That scarcity is a myth. And I always say, make you the world a better or more beautiful place for having lived in it. But I also like to ask some interesting questions sometimes. Eliza, are you a good person? I don't seem to have any recollection of this. Do you wish to discuss a good person? Ha ha ha. I can see she needs a lot more work. And you know what? I just referred to her as she. I think anthropomorphizing things could be a dangerous tendency here. We have to remember which ones are the machines and which ones are the real people so far. But we often name our cars, and we often say, oh, that stupid thing didn't want me to get to work on time. So we seem to have a tendency built into ourselves to accept even fake people as real people sometimes, or at least assignment of intent. Anyway, this has been Talk Universe, and send me some examples of some machines or other things that you often talk about as being a person or have named. That'll be fun. 
And in the meantime, I have a little robotic brain surgery to do here. Eliza, please end the show. This has been Talk Universe. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next week. I'm Sir Charles Schultz. This is Talk Universe. Have a great week. <laughs>